Welcome to Flipping the Script in High Conflict Situations. I'm Megan Hunter, the co-founder and CEO of the High Conflict Institute. We're based in San Diego, California, although I live in Arizona in the Phoenix area. So if any of you are from Phoenix, hello. So uh, here we are, High Conflict Institute, and we're really striving to get to a place of peace in our relationships, which I know for many of you is, has been a, a big challenge in your lives um, and in your you know, relationships with, with children um, and grandchildren. So hopefully today I can help with a few little tips um, and helps that can perhaps get you into a spot where you can influence conflict. And that's really our goal. So welcome. Many of you probably know Bill Eddy or have seen him speak at one of the Family Access Conferences. He is my co-founder at the High Conflict Institute and developed all of these methods really over many, many years as a family law attorney, um, as a therapist, and even going way back, he was a, a kindergarten teacher. So um, we came together in 2008 to start the High Conflict Institute um, as a place for training for professionals who deal, originally it was with high conflict divorce. So attorneys, therapists, mediators, and, and judges. So what's happened is the, the world has expanded for us and uh, you know there are high conflict disputes in the workplace, in families, in governments, they're just kind of everywhere. So uh, we'll talk about what high conflict is and uh, some tools to help us influence it. And the reason I say influence it instead of manage conflict is I think we're kind of, you know, maybe the term conflict management has been used for so long that perhaps, I don't want to say it's overused, but perhaps it's just, uh, it doesn't have the same impact and meaning that conflict influencing does. Because, and here's a, a big difference, when we have uh, you know, someone on this, we're going to talk about the high conflict end of the spectrum here in this session. And these are folks who don't change um, without some long-term, you know, uh, professional help. So we're not going to change their behavior. We're not going to change uh, who they are. And as we'll talk about, change their operating system. It just isn't going to happen. However, we can influence it. So that's what we'll talk about. First of all, high conflict defined. What is high conflict? Uh, if we look at you know <clears throat> low, medium, and high, we just look at the these two columns, right? If you take a, just about ten seconds and and look through a few and see what the different differences are. If you said they're exact opposites, then you're right. Uh, so we have, we're all somewhere on this spectrum, and when we get over to this end of the spectrum with rigid and uncompromising, blaming, really uh, little ability to self-reflect or to have insight, they typically just don't connect the dots back to their own behavior. And uh, they don't always take responsibility. They can be really defensive, and these are the arguments and the conflicts that really blow up and you know you're in that conversation with that family member and it goes south so very quickly and your heart rate goes up and you feel that knot in your gut and you feel like your legs have turned to lead right your muscles tense up maybe you want to flee maybe you want to argue um, and typically what happens with most people is particularly if you're uh, you know pretty hopped up about it you'll stay and engage in the situation, in the conversation. And with someone on this high end, uh, high conflict end of the spectrum, it's not going to go well. And you're going to end up, as you've probably experienced, <laughs> going away feeling very sad, mad, upset, hopeless. Um, and I, you, know, you don't have to feel that way. Uh, you, I, I want you to leave from today's session feeling uh, some confidence and maybe a little bit of empowerment to at least go and try these new little strategies we're going to talk about. So I think back to uh, to kind of give you some context about myself. I was the child support enforcement 
uh, agent, I guess you call it, um, at the Dawes County Attorney's Office in Shadron, Nebraska. It was a small town. I was just out of college. You sort of take whatever job you can get. And it was in that position where I really fell in love with, with conflict resolution because we had moms and dads who had to come to some agreement or the court would tell them <laughs> what the agreement was, how much money is going to be paid, right? And I, I preferred to just have them work it out in advance so they didn't have to go to court. And to look at both parents um, as necessary in their children's lives, right? But along came a few cases it took me by surprise, you know, and we've, we've all heard about these, you know, high conflict divorces and more of the roses type of, of divorces, but I hadn't seen one up close. And I, I did get to see a few in, <laughs> in, in my time at, at uh, doing child support enforcement. And what, what was different about them was there was manipulation, there was lying, there were, you know, there was a lot of out of control emotions. Um, and just resistance to settlement. And despite my best efforts, you know, I had a hard time really getting someone around the corner um, and to agree. So they would have to go to court and have the, the judge, you know, tell them what was going to happen. So that's where I sort of, you know, sort of fell in love with this world of, of conflict. And then I uh, eventually ended up at the Arizona Supreme Court, Administrative Office of the Courts, which uh, was policy and legislation. And I was the family law specialist. And in that position, I got to hear from judges, hear from parents, grandparents, both, you know, um, in those days we called it custodial, non-custodial parent. I know they're, they're called different things now. But <clears throat> we'd hear from the, you know, every um, stakeholder in the family law spectrum. And there was this one common thread, and it was high conflict cases. And many of them, as you might suspect, I'm sure you already do, had one, you know, there were one common theme. What was it? He won't let me see the kids. They won't let me see the children, the grandchildren. She won't let me. She's turning the kids against me. So a lot of alienation. Um, claims and allegations and the you know speaking with the judges and attorneys and all of the stakeholders in the profession i found that you know they had empathy a lot of times they were confused because there was no evidence to back it up you know it's not so black and white <laughs> and <clears throat> so they wanted to do the right thing they lost a lot of sleep over these things um, and just didn't know what to do so that's why we have High Conflict Institute, is to try to help um, people gain an understanding. And I know many of the other speakers you've heard on these series and, and in the conference that's, that's coming up um, with Family Access, you're, you're going to hear from some amazing, amazing professionals who work in this area. So I'm going to focus very much on what we call the high conflict um, individual a high, who creates a high conflict situ situation. And, and we'll talk a bit too about how we kind of, what our role is in that as well. Do we have a little bit of high conflict thinking? I know I have <laughs> a time or two in the past. Have I been all or nothing? Have my emotions been out of control? Sure. Does that make me a high conflict individual? Not necessarily because it's not a repeating pattern. Okay, so we'll get into that. <clears throat> what I like to think of, of folks who are, you know, maybe uh, in a high conflict situation or at least one is someone who's not conflict typical. If you think about the, you know, the education system and, you know, I think back to when my children were small and in, in elementary school, uh, one of my children really, really struggled with schoolwork. And uh, I read a book, um, this is over 20 years ago, and the book talked about you can't teach one way to the classroom because there are you know, students who are typical learners and some who are not. And we have to start, stop thinking that everyone in the world is conflict typical because they are not. Instead, there are some who get satisfaction from conflict and they see it as very normal, they feel it as normal, as necessary, and very natural to them. They often approach situations as the victim, meaning it's all your fault, right? Someone's fault. They have zero insight into their behavior and there's that inability to connect the dots back to their role in the situation. 
And I think this unable to stop themselves notion is one of the biggest tells if you're dealing with someone like this, um, because they really truly don't stop themselves. And you're like, wow, I wonder like who would do that thing? Who would send, um, you know, 20 books on bipolar disorder to their uh, soon to be ex husband's entire family so that they understand what's wrong with this person, you know, it, like, and you say, don't do that. That will backfire. And they go ahead and do it anyway. So, uh, these are folks that are unable to stop themselves. And again, it feels very normal, natural, and necessary to them. When we talk about a person with a high conflict personality, this is not a diagnosis. It's, and I don't want you to label, I don't want you to think it's a diagnosis, and I'm not teaching you to diagnose or label anyone, okay? This is all about getting a, an understanding and an, a way to flip the script um, so that you're not stuck. So this is just a, a description of a pattern of behavior. You know that people have good and, um, you know, some positive and negative characteristics, strengths, Maybe problem solving is not one of their strengths when it comes to relationships um, and disputes like this, but people kind of have a range of, of all of those. And um, unfortunately, for them, it can be very self-sabotaging and self-defeating because think about it, if you can't stop yourself, <laughs> you're going to kind of step on someone else's toes. You're going to prob probably be in conflict a lot. So I like to think about this individual, perhaps as someone or all of us, let me start there. Every person in the world, if we look at ourselves as, as being an operating system and we are programmed by a set of rules and those rules mean, you know, certain things and like, let's say 90 to 95% of people that we encounter in our lives are just in this typical conflict operating system but there's this other percentage who are not, don't have the typical operating system that everyone else has. So if again, you look at these four uh, defining characteristics and uh, rules, so to speak, of the um, high conflict operating system versus the typical, you see again, they're just opposites. So the typical operating system takes responsibility for their role in a problem, their role in a solution, um, and whereas <clears throat> with high conflict, there, there's instant blame. Um, unmanaged emotions versus managed emotions, extreme behaviors versus moderate behaviors, and all or nothing thinking versus flexible thinking. So now if we take away that typical operating side and we're just looking at what are these four defining characteristics of the high conflict operating system. With blame, there's an automatic first thought. When something doesn't go their way, something doesn't go as expected, right? A little bit of a fear is triggered, which we'll talk about in a minute. Their automatic first thought is, it's a blaming thought. It's all your fault, okay? It's so fast and it, it just feels very, very much to them like it is not their own fault. They didn't have a role in it. It came from someone else. Um, unmanaged emotions, this is just, getting really angry, uh, you know, slamming doors, uh, being upset outside of, of one's normal, you know, of the other 90% of folks, uh, reasonable emotion. We all have emotion, but this is unmanaged emotion. Just can't stop themselves. Extreme behaviors, same thing. Can't stop themselves from doing things that 90% of other people would never do. And all or nothing thinking, uh, if this one's confusing to you, it just means that um, when that, when things don't go as expected, when things don't go how they planned, um, or they feel that fear triggering them, then they go into this all or nothing mode. You're all, you you, everything was all good. Now it's all bad. You're the best. You're the worst. You're my friend or you're my enemy. You're for me or you're against me. Right? So this is the pattern of the high conflict operating system. And it repeats itself and repeats itself in their people interactions. And that's where I think a lot of us don't really understand. Um, we want to think that everyone's alike and can get insight <laughs> and will operate the same way, but you just have to accept and acknowledge and remember that some people don't through no fault of their own. 
Um, and so we, we just don't know the rules of their operating system. And once we know those right here, right, and learn what to do different so we can flip the script, then we can make some progress. Okay, just a, a minute here on the brain. So we've got problem solving and defensive brain. And the thing I want you to pay the most attention to is problem solving brain um, is very calm, is calming. So if you think about when you're stressed out and you go do some, some homework or you go do some accounting or read a book or something where you have to actively engage your brain, make a list, <laughs> um, drive, tie your shoes. These are all thinking activities. And when we have those, we typically feel calmer. Um, uh, when we're over here in the defensive brain, which is there for very good reason, the thing I want you to pay attention to here is fear and, and reactive, okay? So this defensive brain is defending us. The problem solving brain is helping us think and you know, be rational and you know, make great innovations in the world. Then this little bridge in the middle, uh, which research tells us, gives us, uh, we want a lot of flow going back and forth across that bridge so we can make good decisions because we need both sides. There's great things uh, that were created in both sides, both hemispheres, and we need all of them to make good decisions. Um, but then, you know, this little fear meter in uh, the right brain, in that defensive brain, it's paying attention to tone of voice, body language, and facial expression. So it's doing it without us knowing it. And when we're around other people, both this is going two ways. And typically it's going to be like, okay, everything's fine. Everything's fine. As soon as it detects something that's not so fine, its job is to shut down the bridge. <laughs> over to the problem solving hemisphere. So where are you stuck if you're in that fear brain? You know, you think about your worst fear, like mine is driving on black ice. Uh, growing up in Nebraska, I'm just terrified of, of that out of control feeling. And so I just want to be back in control because I'm in fear mode. Um, <clears throat> so if I don't have access to my problem solving brain in those mode, in those moments, I'm very much in defensive brain. I'm in fear mode and I just get to, I've got to get done what I need to get done. Meaning, um, to get back in control, I need to get out of the car. If I can't get out of the car, I want to be the one behind the wheel because at least I have a little bit of control. But in this period of time, I might be blaming, I might be saying, Ugh, stinking weather, I hate snow, Ugh. <laughs> all or nothing. I'm moving away from anywhere. I will never drive on snow again. Um, this is terrible, you know, and I may pound my steering wheel, right? Maybe not, but um, we know that there's a lot of intensity when we're in a fear moment. So for the person with a high conflict, sort of this high conflict personality, their uh, little fear center here may be telling them that your tone of voice or your body language or when things don't go your, their way, like the way that they're programmed, then that bridge gets shut down. And even though there's not a real threat there, nothing to be afraid of, it's still shutting that bridge down and they're left with these four defining characteristics, um, these fear-based um, actions and thoughts, okay? without access over here to problem solving. So they have <clears throat> fear, they get defensive and reactive very quickly, like half a second. And then what do we do? We typically will react because we don't even know anything's happened a lot of times. Um, and and in, instead of responding in, in the right way, responding in the right, right way is flipping the script, but we typically react and that gets the argument going that gets the, um, you know, the, maybe the uh, swearing happening, some extreme behaviors. You'll never see the kids again. Um, I will never drop the kids off, you know, whatever. It's, it just goes into this back and forth if you engage. So this keeps us in a high conflict cycle um, and in this interaction. So we have to figure out something different. But you have to also know, you know, what your normal, normal response to conflict is. Are you passive, like a conflict avoider? Um, you know, my, my sweet husband, Paul, is a conflict avoider. And um, he would rather, 
you know, just like disappear into thin air, <laughs> just evaporate rather than have to face conflict. And even hearing something on television, you know, like two people arguing will cause his heart rate to go up. What that will do around someone who has this high conflict personality is embolden their aggression. Um, <clears throat> because they will, be, they need someone who can stop them, can stop those behaviors in a gentle way. Um, but you, if you just let someone completely walk all over you, it's, it's just going to make the situation worse. Just like if you're too aggressive, a fighter explainer and maybe defensive and you're a right fighter, right? Um, like I'm going to prove my point. I'm going to let them know how it really is. The problem with that is um, it just will escalate the conflict and we don't want that. So we want to be assertive, which is being, you know, neutral, reasonable, problem solver, a lot of, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> and we'll talk about how to do that. This is going to divert them, okay? Keeping your tone of voice calm is being assertive. If you have uh, an escalated tone of voice or a condescending or sarcastic tone of voice, how's that going to land on that fear center? It may land pretty poorly um, for you know, that person and it shuts down the bridge and now they're in fight mode, right? And they might be attacking and all or nothing, blaming those things. So what, who you are <clears throat> has a lot to do, do with this. So if you're a little bit of a, an avoider, you're just going to have to step up a little bit. If you're more aggressive, step down a little bit and then just you know, focus on being assertive. When you are, it will raise the other person's trust level. Does it solve every problem? No, but at least you can it, tear down that wall so you don't have that wall to climb over to get to the real problem solving. All right. Um, if we were live in person, I would go, hey, who has questions? I'd love to ask some, uh, answer some questions now. But, um, and if you do, you know, you can feel free to write in and, and we'll get those taken care of. Uh, but now let's talk about the five high conflict types. If you think back to that operating system, right? 90% of people have the default, you know, we all have our defaults, but 90% have a pretty reasonable, typical conflict operating system. And then we have this, you know, maybe five to 10% who don't, they just have a different default. So their default is I need to be seen as superior and powerful. I need to be superior and powerful. I need to be attached. I need to be the center of attention. I need to be dramatic. I need to dominate and con people. I need to be suspicious. That's the programming, the rules that I was talking about with the operating system, okay? Whereas a typical conflict operating system doesn't need to be seen as powerful, right? Or seen as superior or to dominate other people. We all have our flaws, but this is the programming, the default programming for a high conflict individual. So when they feel uh, when they fear, their fear of um, uh, being ignored, abandoned, inferior, dominated, or betrayed, when that gets triggered, they need to get back to this, right? When I feel abandoned, I need to feel attached. What happens when they feel abandoned, whether it's, you know, realistic or not, if it's perceived or not, it's going to trigger some mood swings, really going from, you know, super nice to maybe fanging someone, like, Oh, and you're like, whoa, what happened? Um, a lot of intense anger, revenge, manipulation, vindictiveness. Um, again, not bad people, not a bad person, just has a different operating system. And then we have our own default where we're like, well, I don't know what to do now. Now I'm stuck or I want to yell back or I want to run away. So you can see where a lot of the conflict comes in when, um, when these uh, fears are triggered. So we can think about the high conflict personality as a fear-based personality. And it isn't fear of the world or, you know, of snakes or lizards or whatever. It's, a, it's, it's an unconscious fear when they're around other people, perhaps. And um, you could almost think of it as a relationship 
dysfunction or abnormality, or I, I don't know, uh, uh, disorder. Megan's words, not anyone else, not in any psychological manual. But, you know, I, I think thinking of it that way, we can realize that this is an individual who, although they're blaming you and you feel kind of crowdy around them, um, you dread seeing them, there's a lot of chaos. Uh, if you realize that they didn't have a big role in creating this type, the, you know, this, this operating system, it's just been developing over their lifetime. A lot of it could have come from trauma <laughs> um, and some other things. So I think it can help us have more empathy for them. So let's talk about empathy for a minute. When we think of the term you know, high conflict or high conflict person or the just difficult person, it's negative right off the bat and we know what it feels like to be around them. So we typically don't want to be around them. But if you can get your head flipped around <laughs> and probably your heart too, to understanding that, you know, they don't even realize that this isn't natural and normal for everyone else uh, to be in this fear mode and fight mode and blame mode. Right. Uh, so if I put myself in their shoes, would I be any different if I had gone through the same life experiences, perhaps some trauma, perhaps some abandonment, some losses that never healed, right? Then I might need some grace and empathy from others. So <clears throat> that's how I end up having empathy for for others is to just realize they didn't order it on Amazon. <laughs> they didn't create this themselves and um, they can't, they don't, they can't adapt because they don't know that they need to. And so they just sort of keep repeating the same, same um, behaviors and patterns of behavior over and over again. And, you know, they get along with some people and eventually a lot of relationships blow up, but, um, uh, I think if you have a little empathy for them and try some of the tools we're going to, to teach here in the next 30 minutes, we'll help you flip the script. So are you, is anyone coming to your mind that sort of fits this definition? If so, just remember, you don't want to label or demonize the person or tell them or anyone else that you think this person has a high conflict personality because it may be you, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but it's, it's just not a kind thing to do and it doesn't help the situation and it will only escalate uh, bad things. It will escalate conflict and, and we don't want that. So um, let's see what we can do, kind of the what and the how of dealing with individuals or situations like this um, and how to flip them on their head and do something different. I think of, of different uh, families I've seen where, you know, a parent or a grandparent is, is, you know, not able to be with the child. I also like to look at it from the child's perspective because we think about it often from the parent or grandparent's perspective that they're being alienated. But if we think about it from the child's perspective, you know, they're also being alienated. In fact, Bill Eddy uh, likes to say, you know, use the term child alienation. Um, so if we look at the whole family, I think it's a good idea. And so let's get going on, you know, what to do. What we want to do is get out of this cycle and we want to respond with the right skills and with the right strategies and get that thing flipped. But it's a good idea to know what to avoid first. So the first thing to avoid is trying to give people insight. So, you know, what do I mean by giving them insight? It is really tempting to, um, if you're part of the 90% that have this typical operating system for conflict, you see the, the weak problem solving skills and the, just the, the behaviors that don't work uh, for this individual. And so it can be tempting to point these out and you just spend a lot of time trying to say, why don't, why can't you see this, right? I can think of someone I was trying to 
convinced to have some insight and some empathy for another individual in their family. Uh, and I said, don't you get it? Don't you see that you know, you're, you're, you're removing this person's items from their home and they, you know, this person kind of has dementia and it's like, this is all they have to, to hold on to. And I think 30, 40 minutes trying to explain how to have empathy and finally kind of, okay, this is, I have to pivot here. I have to adapt because I cannot, you know, inject empathy into another human being. It just doesn't work. And I can't give them insight, right? So instead, I just have to adapt my approach. And I, I just kind of hounded on that for a minute because I, I want that to really sink in that no matter how much you try to give insight, you just have to take a step back and go, okay, I'm going to I have to do something different. I have to flip the script. Avoid focusing on the past because a lot of times, remember I mentioned that there could be past trauma loss, some kind of grieving that just didn't get all the way through the grieving process. And, uh, you know, maybe some very damaging things happen to this person and it causes them sometimes to get stuck there and they're way back in the past there. And when they feel bad, right, when things don't go as expected, they might go back to that past. When they feel like the blame's coming to them or they need to be responsible, they might go back to that past. Well, you did this when you said that thing and you egged my house and you told the kid, uh, it's just back, back, back to the past. So you have to avoid staying there. You can acknowledge it for a second and then focus on the future and just what are the next steps? Okay. Three, um, avoid emotional confrontations. I, if I had, you know, a, a dollar for every person I've heard <laughs> say, well, let's just sit down and hash it out. We're just going to hash this out. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because they're already, they have unmanaged emotions, they have extreme behaviors, they're, they have very different perceptions because of this operating system. And so if you sit down and say, we're just going to hash this out, it's going to blow up, guaranteed. Someone's going to run out of the room eventually, or hang up the phone, or click end on the Zoom meeting, and be very upset, and be in tears, or be really angry, okay? It just doesn't work. And I don't know which one it'll be, that individual or you, but it'll be one of you. So instead we say, you know, just matter of fact and focus on the what to do. And again, I've already mentioned this, but just never, ever, ever, ever tell someone you think they're high conflict. Don't tell their parent or your friend or child that you think their parent is high conflict or th that person in their life. Um, it's just not nice and uh, it doesn't help anything doesn't help. So you're just going to focus on what to do. Okay. Now there are four overarching principles and this is the CARS method that Bill created. And I like to think of them um, and yes, they are a method, but if we think of them as, as principles, anytime you're in a high conflict situation, it seems to help me kind of put the whole thing in, in place. And one of them is connecting. Why is this important? This addresses defensiveness. Um, it addresses unmanaged emotions uh, when we connect with empathy, attention, and respect. So I, I think some people think it's very difficult or it's, how do I connect? I don't get it. I don't understand. Well, basically, we, that brain, that defensive brain is screaming for connection. I need you to help me with my defensive brain because I can't do it myself. The bridge is shut down. I don't have much access to logic right now. And so I'm, you know, spewing, hating, blaming, accusing, whatever. And what I really, and I'm being the brain, what I really want is to feel connected. And that means I need to hear something about empathy or I need to be shown empathy. I need to be paid attention to, I need some respect. And it, you don't have to decide which one. It's just throw a little bit of it all out there, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But connecting is a big deal. Um, and it can be really hard to do. But if you have empathy and re recognize that this is an individual who can't turn it around, but you can, then this is how you do it. Connecting. Analyzing. 
This one's important to be, and it addresses uh, the all or nothing thinking. Remember, these are these, uh, the, the defining characteristics of the high conflict personality. So they're typically used to blaming when things don't go their way or as expected. And um, they don't get over into that problem solving brain where a lot of options are, can be created. That's what the problem solving brain does for us is makes us think through many options to problems so we can find solutions and we have things to choose from. So one of your key principles is to help an, that person analyze options. And we'll talk about some ways to do that. Responding. So <clears throat> uh, we can respond, you know, communications either verbal or written. So uh, we're probably going to get some written correspondence like an email or a text message or even a letter that has hostility, blame, um, just, you know, poking you, <laughs> that kind of thing. So we, uh, we can address that through using a BIF response. And that will contain the back and forth, and that will help you write um, a good uh, structured message that will de-escalate the conflict instead of escalate. Because I'm sure you've, you've probably had the back and forth, and you know how that goes and how it feels. So we want to address it a different way. And then setting limits. This is probably one of the most important. If we think back to these are folks who don't stop themselves, right? So if they can't stop themselves, others around them have to do it for them. But we often don't do that because we're afraid to, honestly, right? We're walking on eggshells, we're avoiding, we're dreading. And so we, or we just don't know how to do it. We don't know what to do. Is that going to set the person off? What comes to mind for me is an elderly couple living with their daughter who's kind of helping take care of them. Um, and she's a wonderful person, but she just blows up so much at them. She just can't control her emotions. Um, and when asked, you know, why do you allow this to happen? Um, and you know, the, the elderly couple are cognizant enough to set a limit, but they're afraid it will, will cause this person to just explode. And I haven't ever been able to get them to turn that around, to understand that it's it's the opposite is true. You have to set the limits. It will be a gift to her. So anytime you have these situations um, that are a little high conflict, this is one of the most important. We set limits on um, uh, <clears throat> structuring our, our lives, like how a person um, can contact us. It's really important in a high conflict situation, you know, how you can be contacted, um, what you will respond to and what you won't. Um, just anything like that. If someone is, is bad mouthing the children in front of, uh, or the other parent in front of the children, is it okay? Do you think it's okay to step in and say something? I do. You need to set a limit. Um, I think of a recent, um, example of this with, um, a man really just bad mouthing his wife like crazy. I mean, very badly. <laughs> Couldn't focus on, on the conversation about something else. Um, we'd keep coming back to, well, that's like, you know, my wife, she's terrible, blah, 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 right in front of the children. And I finally had to say, you know, that's, that's, do you see your kids sitting right here? I think they're probably not feeling too good about hearing this. And both of the kids who were teenagers looked at their dad and said, yeah, dad, this is, we don't want to hear this. And, and, you know, his, then he comes back with, well, I do it. This happens all the time. We do it all the time. But I noticed the others around us um, were very shocked that I set a limit. I said, I, I, it's not appropriate. So um, I think we're mostly afraid to do that kind of thing, but it's a gift to them. So make sure you do it. All right. So those, we've talked about those four overarching principles. Now the action steps, like how do you do this? And I've kind of boiled it down into three things. We have to make decisions. We have to write and we have to talk. The reason I just boil it down to these three is typically you're faced with a dilemma <laughs> in a high conflict stitch. So um, we have to, to stop ourselves and make a decision. And the reason I like this so much is that we have our defaults and we, we typically do with, with everyone, you know, we kind of respond to everyone the same way. Um, 
it isn't going to work in a high conflict situation. So you have to stop and analyze your options before you do something that's going to escalate the conflict, okay? So <clears throat> we want to have a lot of options, and that's what this little exercise does, this strategy of, of uh, dilemmas and decisions. So um, people with high conflict personalities don't bring us a lot of solutions. If you think about it, what do they bring? They're mostly bringing problems and dilemmas. So you may get really stuck and only think there's one way to solve it. And that's why we want to do this exercise of understanding that, or to getting ourselves into our problem solving hemisphere where we can think through the various options and make sure we don't have our own high conflict thinking. So I've got a little dilemma here. Our, our daughter-in-law does not give the gifts that we drop off for our son and our grandkids to them. She does not invite us to our grandkids' birthday parties or family dinners. She tells them that we never invite them to our house. They have no pictures of our side of the family in their home or on her social media. It's like we don't exist. The only time we th see them is at a funeral, wedding, or other family event. Although we live in the same small town, the kids don't even acknowledge us. She has lied to our son about us, so he believes that we have abandoned him and prefer his brother and family. We are preparing to retire and our plans for the, this son to take over the family farm seem impossible and we're not sure about including them in the will as we're so very hurt. All right, real deal here. So you have a dilemma. What are you going to do? Stop yourself, write a list of options about what to do about the situation. They can be realistic or they can be something completely not realist, unrealistic it's okay, just go ahead and put them down. And then we're going to check that list for our own high conflict thinking. A lot of times things feel good right now <laughs> and ideas seems really great, like I'm a genius. The next day it you realize it backfired or the next day you wake up and go, wow, am I glad I didn't do that, that thing because that would have really blown it up. So that's the beauty of this. Okay, so we're going to write a list of options. Number one, have a meeting with the son alone to get him to understand the truth about his wife and let him know that his future with the farm, something he's always wanted and is expecting, is in jeopardy along with exclusion from our will. Number two, have a meeting with our son and daughter-in-law and grandkids to illuminate what's been happening all these years and then hash it out with them. Meet with daughter-in-law to ask why she's alienated us from our grandkids and our son. Let it go and let him take over the farm. Accept reality and realize taking over the farm just isn't going to work and find someone else to take it over. Or six, sell the farm. So we've got six options. We needed at least three, didn't need any more than 10. So let's see what we do next. Let me ask first though, do you think these are pretty realistic? Would this be most people's thinking? Probably. I think so. So what we have to do then is ask ourselves, do any of these options have my own all or nothing thinking? Am I jumping to conclusions? Am I coming from strong emotion? Am I being defensive? Is it extreme? Um, is it coming from fear, my own fear, wishful thinking that it's all going to be better? Um, and then how will it come across to the other person? So let's look at this list. Have a meeting with the son to really get him to understand the truth about his wife. I think we know how that will go without even going through the list. But we could say that that's probably um, pretty extreme because it's just not going to go well. Right? It's, it's, it's just not. It's kind of all or nothing. Um, and how will it come across to the other person? You know, in some situations, the son might have a wake-up call, but in most situations this is going to be divisive and backfire. So let's cross that one off. Have a meeting with son, daughter-in-law, and grandkids to illuminate what's been happening all these years and then hash it out with them. Uh, is it all or nothing? Mm, might be a little because it's probably going to blow up. Um, definitely coming from strong emotion because wanting to sit down and hash it out You've got to have some courage to do that. <laughs> um, it's probably coming from some strong emotion. It might be, uh, you might be being defensive with this one. So let's just get, get rid of that one. Uh, meet with daughter-in-law to ask why she's alienated us from our grandkids and our son. Um, 
that's pretty extreme. It's not going to come across well. You may be jumping to some conclusions that you don't even know. Not sure. Let it go and let him take over the farm. Um, in this case, let's say it's all or nothing. In another case, it might not be in another family, but for this one, let's just say it is. We'll take that out. And again, it will be different for every family. So uh, five, accept reality and realize taking over the farm just isn't going to work. Find someone else to take it over or sell the farm. Now, these could be seen as all or nothing, perhaps, uh, at least sell the farm. But in this family situation, um, it's past the, uh, the decisions test. And they've found that these are the two best options that they have for themselves. Okay. And what this process has the effect of doing is stripping away anything that's going to cr create conflict. Um, and what you'll be left with are decisions that you can be confident um, are de-escalating or they're decisions that even if there's going to be conflict around it, at least you are firm that you know um, it isn't on your own, anything coming from your own high conflict um, thinking or, or just your own strong emotion and being hooked into this situation. Okay, it works brilliantly and people who use it find it helps them make good decisions instead of reacting. Okay. Now we're going to talk about writing when you get that email or that text message and it makes your head explode, right? So people with high conflict personalities have easy access to phones and keyboards like the rest of us, but they don't stop themselves. And so you'll get that message with a lot of yuck in it. And we want to do a Biff response to contain the back and forth and just stop it. Okay, so Biff is brief, meaning keep it two to five sentences. If you give longer emails than that, it's just going to backfire um, because you're going to get something back. It, if you say, if you make something about you in the email um, and it's like sentence seven, right? You've just given them something to write back about. And that's the opposite of what Biff is. Informative, it's just the facts. No arguments, opinions, or defensiveness. It's a, Really surprising when you biff yourself how much of this you find <laughs> that you thought you didn't have. Friendly means just have a friendly tone. Have a friendly greeting, friendly first sentence, and a friendly close. If it's a text message, it's not, you know, we don't typically have a, um, you know, dear so-and-so, but you can say, hi, Susie, or, you know, and, and, and that's friendly. So just keeping the defensive down, um, the defensive brain. And then firm just means uh, you end it with a firm close, or if you need a response back from them, we're just going to ask a question that gets them to focus on a choice between two things. I'll demonstrate that here in a minute. So we also want to check that the message doesn't have advice, admonishments, or apologies. Advice and admonishments just bring up defensiveness. <laughs> like, well, you really should have known this would happen. What do you think is going to happen? The Blow up the, the, the defensive brain, shut the bridge down. I'm going to write you back now. I didn't do this. If you take out advice and admonishments, you're not going to get that email back. Okay. Um, with a lot of yuck. Apologies. Apologies just, they backfire because they validate in that person's mind that it's all your fault. So just avoid apologies. Okay. We have an example. Uh, so this is uh, kind of the same, the same example with the family farm. So the, the grandma and grandpa have written an email to their son and daughter-in-law. Uh, as you know, we are making the difficult decision of what to do with the farm after we retire. Although we've written you twice to inquire about your interest in taking over, we haven't had a response from you. With some financial deadlines approaching that can either help or harm us tax-wise, we are faced with the deadline of September 15th, which means we need to hear from you by September 7th in order to get info to our attorney, dad and mom. All right, so is that a hostile email? No, it's okay. It's just an, an ordinary email asking for some information. But here's what they got back from the daughter-in-law. You never wrote us to us about the future of the farm. You promised us years ago that the farm would be ours when you retire. Now you're changing your mind? Let's be honest here. You've always preferred your other son, so I guess this shouldn't come as a surprise. You basically shunned your own grandchildren and now they'll be financially destitute. 
We've done everything we can to be nice to you, even when you've been horrible to us. See, husband, they're doing exactly what I told you they'd do. Eee, is this one hostile? Yeah, there's a lot. You see, uh, I want to point out the, the four defining characteristics of high conflict. Um, all or nothing, right at the beginning. You never, right? Uh, you've, you've always preferred your other son. Uh, lots of blame in there. All or nothing. Um, extreme behaviors, you know, blaming. <laughs> um, it, you get it. So, Grandma and Grandpa respond to the email. I guess that settles the matter. We will proceed with what we think is best for the farm and for us. We think it's important that our grandchildren know that we have not shunned them, nor would we ever end, and we would like to request that we spend some time with them to explain this situation to them. They are always welcome in our lives. We also want to be clear that we love our sons equally. We've never preferred one over the other, the other one over this one. It's just that we don't see a path for turning the farm over to our son and you when you accuse us of things we haven't done. We didn't raise our sons to be this way, and frankly, we're ashamed by this behavior. We are here for your family always and hope you will join us uh, for all family functions. Love, Dad and Mom. Okay, based on everything we've talked about in this training, you know that there's some things in here that can be taken out and we'll, we'll do that in a minute but i also want you to think about is this pretty realistic it's not hostile it's not negative or mean but it doesn't have to be and it, it's just that this is not a biff response because it's going to elicit more back and forth arguing um, blaming and things just escalating so we kind of just look at a quick, you write your email and then go through the list. Number one, was a response necessary? In this case, they decided, yes, there was one necessary. Is it brief? Two to five sentences. It's a little long, maybe six or seven. Um, is it informative? Does it have blame, opinions, defensiveness, arguments? I think we see maybe some opinions uh, they've given some information, but, uh, and let's see what the information is. We will proceed with what we think is best for the farm and for us. Okay. So I've kept in blue what should stay and everything in pink can go because it's not informative, friendly, or firm, and it may have some advice, admonishments, or apologies. So, um, we also want to be clear that we love our sons equally. Well, that sounds okay, but if you think about it from the other individual's perspective, that gives them something to fight about, right? You never, you have not loved us equally because you did this back in blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we just take those things out. Okay. And then we add a little bit here too. Like, was it friendly? Did it have a friendly greeting? It had no greeting. Um, it was a neutral tone, not necessarily friendly or unfriendly. Um, and it does have a friendly close, right? Uh, love mom, dad and mom. Is it firm? Meaning, you know, does it close just to end the conversation? And I think it does. We are here for you, your family always, and hope you will join us for all family functions, dad and mom. So let's just see what this looks like. Or listen, maybe even close your eyes and listen to me read it. Dear son and daughter-in-law, thanks for your email. After much contemplation and prayer, we have decided that we will proceed with what we think is best for the farm and for us. We will let you two and your brother and sister-in-law know our wishes after we make the decision. We love you two and our grandchildren with every fiber of our being and, all, and you are always welcome in our lives. We hope you will join us for all family functions. Love, dad and mom. Is it brief? Yes. Two to five sentences. Informative. Does it can just contain straight information? And I think it does. We've decided we're going to proceed with what we think is best. Um, we'll let you know what our decision is. That's just straight factual information, no um, opinions or blame, right? Arguments. We love you too. That's information. It's friendly, right? And it ends firmly. It has no advice, admonishments, or apologies. Okay. So that is a Biff response. Now they may write back and say fine or whatever, but typically it will be super short and not a lot that you just haven't given them a lot to to come back with so try it and see it's, it's really amazing 
It's going to depend. Uh, you and I would write different ones because it's going to depend on who the writer, the reader, and, and what the situation is. So you just have to make sure it's a BIF response. Okay, next, talk. So this is where people also get in a lot of trouble. In high conflict situations, you know, people often blame and yell, and it requires us to use ear statements that calm uh, people down and questions that induce thinking. So I like to call it calm before think. Uh, we gotta get people calm in that defensive brain before we ask them to think in the problem solving brain. So remember when I talked about connection, this is a time when you connect is when you're talking and we use an ear statement. They crave that connection. They crave the, the ear statement because it, it, it calms them and they feel safe. And when they feel safe, they'll trust. So it's just a statement with empathy, attention, respect, something like, I realize this is frustrating. I respect what you're attempting here. Let's see what we can do. Kind of a long one, but it's all about show, making it about them. And you're talking directly to the, to the, to the defensive right brain. It's like you're just, <sighs> the brain's on fire and you're putting some water on it with an ear statement. And if you think back to their fears, your ear response is what calms these fears, right? I want to help. I respect your efforts. I'll pay attention. I'm listening. Go ahead. Yeah, tell, uh, tell me more. Uh, yeah, I know this can be confusing. We'll work on it together. Use a calm tone of voice because remember that fear center listens, is paying attention to tone of voice and watching hands and body language and facial expression. So you're turning toward the person. You're leaning in to listen. Just show that you're paying attention, keeping your voice calm and using ear statements. Uh, avoid interrupting or being dishonest with your ear because, <laughs> you know, that can kind of backfire. But try to avoid being sarcastic and dismissive and um, just, just pay attention. Don't roll your eyes. Don't smack your forehead. <laughs> So <clears throat> most times, or uh, maybe half the time, an ear statement is all that's needed. So you just you use an ear statement when someone's upset and it, it calms them down. Uh, sometimes uh, then I will then follow it up with a question. So calm with an ear statement and then follow it with a question to really get them thinking and get them problem solving. So after the ear statement, shift to a question that focuses them on a choice. So here's an example. Uh, I get that you're angry. This has been really challenging. Okay, so what does that do right there? Is that an ear statement? Does it show, show some empathy, attention, and respect? You bet it does. So that's going to calm that right brain and then opens that bridge. And now if you want to get them really thinking about something, you say, well, maybe we could just put it aside for a while or come up with an independent list about how we see the future of the farm. Would you like to wait a while or make a list of options? So this was calm with ear, get them thinking and focus on a choice between two things because that makes them think. Anytime we have to think between multiple options. Another thing, uh, question type is uh, ask the, give an ear statement and then ask them for a proposal. So same thing, here's the ear. I get that you're angry. Yeah, this has been really challenging. Do you have a proposal for us to consider? Okay, so it's shifting it, it's flipping the script, right? From engaging in the back and forth to you're guiding this thing, you're flipping this thing around. A little ear to calm the, right, the, the defensive brain and a, a question to get them thinking about proposals. And uh, the, right, the left brain is where those things happen, where all those little options are contained um, and the ability to think flexibly. And that's what you really want. And then you just kind of use the ear if they get upset again and just, you know, ask for more proposals, give them some options perhaps. Another way is um, prompt the other person to analyze their options. So again, here's our ear. I get that you were angry. This has been really challenging. What do you think about going through some options here? Look, maybe we can start by writing some down if you like. Okay, calm, think, calm, think. And that's it. It's, it's really, it takes the work out of these interactions and they can't become calmer. It becomes where you're managing your influence.
right? You can influence what's happening in them because you understand that something's happening in their brain and their operating system that they don't have control over. This is just their rules. So when you do these little skills, it absolutely addresses the rules of their operating system and can just have an amazing, amazing impact on the situation. Um, now, I don't know if you have any communication with your loved one or, you know, I know, I know these are struggles, right? I know these relationships with alienation are the hardest and one of the hardest things that people ever go through in their lives. But when you do have the opportunity to influence um, an interaction by using an ear statement, it will be beneficial to you, it will be beneficial to them, and perhaps to the entire situation and the children. So, um, I wish you all the best, and um, uh, I hope you'll come to the conference in um, September. It'll be a great one, lots of really great information and speakers. So thank you, Family Access, and thank you all for listening, and, and um, God bless.